welcome to a Monday. So this is the sixth lecture uh, for the evolution part of Bio1B. Um, are there any questions from the last lectures? Okay, nothing? Everybody enjoyed the Cal-UCLA game? It's okay? Yeah, that was, that was a good game. All right, so my plan today is to uh, finish up briefly uh, with migration. So we talked about the four different forces that change allele frequencies in a population, mutation, natural selection, genetic drift. Um, I want to uh, talk uh, briefly about migration, and then we'll talk about some examples of, of selection, not only uh, experimental evolution, that is to say, evolution in the laboratory, and then an example of evolution in the wild, okay? So just to finish up on migration, this is not a very complicated idea, but the idea now is that we have two populations of, from the species. Remember, each species has at least one population, but we imagine a species that has two populations. There's population one and population two, and migration is just movement of individuals from one population to the next. So in this case, you're going to have movement of individuals from this population to that or that population to this. And so is it for, you know, migration can change allele frequencies for the obvious reason that if there's a mutation that appears in this population and an individual that bears that mutation moves from this population to that, the, that population, the, then the, the allele frequencies have obviously changed. Now the main thing you should realize about migration is it's a force that hom homogenizes uh, the frequencies in different populations. It makes the frequencies of alleles more similar to each other, okay? So if you have lots of migration between two populations, the allele frequencies in the two populations can become very similar. If you cut off migration, that is to say you just all of a sudden don't allow migration between two population, populations, what can happen? Well, the allele frequencies over time will become more and more different. And that makes sense. If you have a mutation that appears in this population, there's no way for this mutation to get into this population unless it occurs independently over here, right? And similarly, you're allowing genetic drift. Uh, if, you know, if you have, even if you start the two populations off uh, with the same allele frequencies and then you turn off, off migration, then genetic drift will occur dif differently in the two populations. Maybe the allele will become fixed in this population and lost in this population, okay? When we get to speciation, you'll see that uh, migration and, and specifically turning off migration, sort of speaking, you know, think about having little knobs, you turn up natural selection, turn down not natural selection, turn up migration, turn down migration. If you turn off, uh, turn off migration rather, you, you actually will um, make the two populations over time will become more and more different and eventually they can become new species. Okay. Now there are examples of, um, of migration. One that I'll, I'll just give you is, is uh, involves domesticated rice. And there was a variant of rice that was tested in a plot um, called Liberty Rice. It was, what was the strain? It was LL601. That was the strain name. The, this, this particular strain of rice was um, resistant to a herbicide. The herbicide was called Liberty Herbicide. So this was called Liberty Strain of Rice because it was resistant to this herbicide. And it was grown in a few test plots from 1998 to 2001 and it was never approved for human consumption, so that was the end of it. They terminated the experiment. But it turns out that through migration, some of these, some of these Liberty rice genes got into domesticated rice that was, uh, was approved for human consumption and it was actually exported across the world, around the world. And so this started to creep up a few years after this test plot was done, and people became very concerned about it, that you actually had these the, this, this particular strain had actually invaded the, the domesticated rice. And so it actually was such a, a concern that Japan for, for one month actually banned the um, rice imports from the U.S. So from that perspective, migration actually had a, you know, economic cost to the farmers who exported rice, right? So this is just one example of, of, of um, migration. Of course, you might hear about lots of concerns that people have currently about um, about basically migration. That is to say, we might have uh, genetically engineered crops, for instance, and the concern is that these genetically engineered, the genes from these genetically engineered crops might invade wild populations. For instance, if you make, a, you know, make, a, make specific strains, that specific crops uh, resistant to herbicides, the concern is that maybe those genes will get into the wild populations of weeds and before you know it, we'll have 
weeds that are also resistant to the her herbicide. Now that hasn't really occurred very much and people kind of debate the importance of this force, but it is a potential concern that you should be aware of. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to say about, um, yes, where's the question? Oh yeah, oh, sure. Um, I don't know if I can actually turn it up or I can reposition it. Is that better? Okay, so maybe it's too close to my throat. There's another, I sort of forgot to mention, there have been, uh, I don't want to say complaints, but concerns about the quality of the uh, slide images for the recording. So a lot of people obviously um, don't show up to the morning lectures and they watch the lectures on, on, the, on the web. And I'm, and I'm sorry about that. I mean, that's, there's, there's, that's the one downside, I guess, of not being here in person is that the quality of the images in the webcast aren't, aren't as crisp as they are here. Of course, those people can download the PDFs and they have a very good version of it. So, you know, that there's nothing really I can do about it. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to say about um, population genetics. That was, that was it. That's the end of the mathy part of, of evolution. Okay? Now, like I said, I want to go into examples of, examples of selection. And the two examples I want to give are experimental evolution. and then a natural selection in the wild. Okay. Now there's lots of examples of um, experimental, experimental evolution. So here's an example which you're probably familiar with if you ever eat corn. So this is the domesticated corn. This is the type of corn you find in the supermarket. Of course, corn has not always been like that. What is the wild relative of corn? It's, it's a plant called teosinte, okay? And it has very tiny uh, kernels and very pathetic cobs, okay? And over time, and, and people have a pretty good record of what corn looked like in the past because you often find uh, ancient corn in archaeological digs. So we can actually document what it looked like in the past. But then, anyways, what you're seeing here is this is what the female part of the corn plant looks like. This is the male tassel. Um, this is what the male part looks like. And this is what, what's happened over time between just selecting for larger kernel size and uh, larger cobs of corn is done to, to teosinte. And there's actually a really interesting experiment, a very long-term experiment that's been performed since 1896 in Illinois, okay, at the agricultural station in Illinois. And what they, so this is the number of generations, over 100 generations of uh, selection for oil content in, in corn. And so this is what the oil content was in the late 1890s, over time, people selected the corn to have higher oil, oil content. That is to say, you let the corn reproduce that has the highest oil content in your field, okay? And, and you can see here, they've got these high selected lines where you've, you've gone from about 5% to over 20% oil content in the, in the kernels. And then at certain times, they actually reversed the experiment. So here, somewhere around the 1940s, they said, let's try and divide the plots and let's start to reverse the selection in the opposite direction. So we'll keep selecting for high oil content, but we'll take this other plot of land and have all the corn on that land, we'll start to select for low oil content. And this is what you see, okay? And they've, they've also had a low oil content plot uh, as well over time. So you, for al almost any domesticated species that we're interested in, we can select for traits, um, as long as there's some variation, we can select for traits and get almost anything we want. Give, it, give us enough time, give humans enough time and they can select for traits, domesticated crops, um, that uh, will have almost any feature you want. So let me, um, before I get to the, the viral example, let me talk about an example um, that I really love that, that comes from Michael Rose's lab at UC Irvine. And what Michael Rose does is he, he um, studies senescence, okay? So I don't, I kind of debate whether even to talk to you guys about senescence because you, all your life, all you've known is getting bigger and stronger and better, so to speak, right? You're about 18, 19, 20, and basically up to about 18, 19, or 20, things are good. I remember those days. It's, you get stronger and bigger. You look better looking than you are. You'll ever be a, in your life again, okay? But from here on out, let me assure you, it's downhill, okay? <laughs> Every year, your memory gets worse. Like if I work out, the, I, it takes me forever to recover, and I'm miserable. It's just, it's, it's, it's worse, and from my, from my perspective, it only gets worse from here on out, right? Because eventually, you know, you senesce and you, things just fall apart and you die, okay? <laughs> so it's, it's a very, but this is something we all have to face, 
And there is an interesting question, why? Why do we senesce? Wouldn't it be better to be 80 years old and have lots of children? Wouldn't natural selection favor that? Okay? And so there is this question of what is the evolutionary explanation for aging or senescence? And the, the, the example goes like this. Let me, we have to sort of imagine a perfect population or, or a population of individuals that don't age, if you can imagine that. So that is to say, somebody who's 80 looks as, just as good as somebody who's 20, is just as fit, just as strong, okay? So there's no difference in their fitness or, or essentially their physiological age. They don't age. But just because you don't age doesn't mean you don't die. So let's imagine you're like a, a deer, right, that doesn't age. Well, you still can be run down by a mountain lion and eaten, right? That doesn't mean you don't die. Or if, if humans didn't age, it doesn't mean we didn't get run over by a bus or get in a car accident and die, right? There's, just because you don't age doesn't mean you don't die. So keep that distinction in mind. So let's imagine a population of organisms where each year there's a probability of 90.95 that they survive. Okay, 5% of each cohort. So you, know, you have a bunch of individuals that are born, and every year, 5% of them are picked off and they die. Maybe the mountain lions eat 5% of that cohort every year. You with me? So what is the probability that you make it to 10 years? I believe I put that down. It's about 0 0.77. So about 77% of the cohort, that imaginary cohort of non-aging organisms, will still be alive to 10 years from now. That means over a quarter of them have still died, right? And then what's the chance of them making it 50 years? It's 7%. Only 7% are alive after 50 years. They're still not those 50-year-old those animals or plants, whatever they are, look just as fit as the one-year-old ones, right? But there's only 7% of that cohort left. And then you can ask, well, what's the probability that you make it to 100 years? And it's about 0 0.005, or about half a percent in this imaginary population. Only half a percent are still alive after 100 years in this ideal non-age. And those half percent of 100-year-old Animals look great, right? But they're, they're only represent a small fraction of the cohort that was alive 100 years ago. So this is the scenario we, we're, we're picking up, we're, I'm trying to describe. So what this means is that if you have a, a, a beneficial mutation that acts early in life, there's more individuals on which that beneficial mutation can act. If this beneficial mutation only affects 80-year-old individuals, then only a small fraction of the population can experience that beneficial mutation and it won't be as strongly selected. So it also means that if you have a beneficial mutation that acts early in life, but has a detrimental effect later in life, that that's, that mutation can spread. Because there's more individuals on which it can act, and even the detrimental effect will be experienced by just a few individuals. Okay, so that's, that's the model. That's the theory. Okay? So what did Michael Rose do? Well, he said, well, let's test this theory. What, what basically, the, the explanation for why organisms age and why you kind of evolution of aging is because of this model I just described. And I should mention too that obviously senescence or aging uh, evolves, right? Because if you look at humans, we live what? 70, 80 years old, 70 or 80 years. Look at our closest relatives, the chimps. Even in conditions as benign as the ones we live in, they only live 50 or 60 years. Okay, and if you go further out and you look at a house mouse, right? They're closer, they're related to us in, in an evolutionary sense, they're kind of closely related to us. They, uh, they only live maybe three years, right? So between mi mice and humans, humans live 80, mice live three. There's been a lot of, you know, obviously aging is something that evolves. So Michael Rose said, well, maybe we can make Drosophila, flies, fruit flies, evolve in terms of aging in the lab. And, and you should know that the usual, how, the, the, the Drosophila melanogaster, the, the workhorse for modern genetics, they only live about three or four weeks. Right? And flies, they don't, they don't suffer from things like, you know, insects typically don't get cancers like mammals do, but um, they do show signs of senescence. You know, their wings become tattered, they're less active, they're less productive in terms of you know, their reproductive ability. They, they age like any other organism. So what he did is he said, let's make these late-acting mutations that normally natural selection doesn't care about, let's make those late-acting mutations important. So how do you do that? Well, he only let the flies reproduce when they got old. So you can think of this as sort of the career woman experiment, but only in flies, right? <laughs> so um, at first he wouldn't let the flies mate until they were two or three weeks old. So you can easily, with flies, you can, you know, they, they, they're larvae, and they kind of dig around in the bottom of the, of, the, of the vial, getting food, and then when they um, metamorphose into flies, you can easily separate the males and the females. So you can have a female flask, and you have a male flask of flies, 
And it's then quite easy to say, you know, you, the, they can only date, so to speak, when they get to three weeks old, right? So only the, the oldest flies are reproducing. And then you can raise the bar. So it'd be, instead of three weeks, you make it four weeks. Instead of four weeks, you make it five weeks, the age at which they're allowed to reproduce. And after a while, you had flies that were living 10 days longer on, on average. Okay, so that'd be kind of equivalent to humans living, what, 120 years instead of 80, 90 years. And then he continued the experiments even further and eventually got flies that were living about six months. He called these the, the strain of flies, this, this, the strain of flies that he selected for his so-called Methuselah strain, for obvious reasons. Okay, they're very old flies. So there is, there is a, you can actually select for aging, and you can actually, you know, aging is like any other trait. You can actually make it evolve in the lab. Okay? But once again, the, the, what he did in the lab is make these late-acting deleterious mutations uh, important so to speak. Normally, the, normally natural selection doesn't see these late acting mutations because so few individuals are around to experience them, um, but he made them important, okay? Are there any questions about that? It's a great experiment, and if you're really interested in it, you can go to his website and you can, you can download his papers. They're quite interesting papers. You, you can also imagine he's gotten a lot of funding for this work, often looking at which mutations were responsible for the old age in his, in his strain of flies, with the idea being that you know, whatever mutations are responsible for increased longevity in his fly strains might also be important for, say, us. Okay. So there are, there are ramifications for these types of studies for human health. Okay, so now I want to go to another example of natural s or a selection, but only this time in the, in the lab, uh, once again, but using viruses. And the, the experiment was uh, performed by these two people. This is Jim Bull who's at the University of Texas, and this is Holly Wickman, who's at uh, University of Idaho in, in Moscow. And they were working on these critters. And these critters, what are they? This is a, a scanning electron micrograph of uh, a virus called Phi X174. Um, so it's Phi X174. And this is just, a, it's a virus that infects E. coli. This is the, the bacterium that you can find in your gut. You know, you can raise E. coli quite easily in the lab. In fact, it's a, a standard strain, a bacterium that people often raise in labs for molecular biology type work. And, um, and basically, you know, if you had a flask, say, of E. coli that was happily growing at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, and you threw in one of these guys, before you know it, the strain would become kind of clear. Basically, you throw in one of these guys that gets into an E. coli, and about 200 pop out killing that bacterium, and they infect other bacteria and so forth. And before you know it, a large fraction of the, of the culture of, of E. coli will be dead. And there you have lots of Phi X174. The Phi X174 genome um, is a, a double-stranded DNA, and it's circular. So um, viruses, like any other critter, have uh, genomes. This is a very small genome. So our genome is about, you know, 3 billion ACGs and Ts. This one has a genome that's 5,383 ACGs and Ts. So it's quite small. In fact, this was the first organism to have its genome sequenced, I think, in like 1977. It's the very first organism to have its entire genome sequenced. And the number, or the letters here, represent the genes. And so the genes um, are given actually just letters for, the, for their names. So you can, you can talk about the G protein or the H protein or the A protein. And there's a couple of genes here where you see B overlaps with A, star overlapping with A. This is one of these cases where you actually have multiple coding regions in the same same uh, piece of DNA, which is unusual, but you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about remembering any of the genes here. What they did is normally, like I said, the E. coli grows well at 37 degrees Celsius, and the bacteria, the Phi X174, is also well adapted for 37 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature at which its host lives, right? So if you're a, if you're a Phi X174 and you can reproduce rapidly at 37 degrees Celsius, you're, you're golden, right? You're okay. What they did is they raised the temperature of the, uh, the, at which they incubated the, the E. coli from 37 degrees Celsius to 43 degrees Celsius. Now, what happens? The, the Phi X174 initially aren't as good. So what you see here is you have this um, zero line. This is the fitness of the phage. Uh, the phage. And when I say phage, I mean uh, virus. So people call these uh, viruses that infect the E. coli bacteriophage, all right, for bacterial viruses. So I, I've just realized that I'm saying both words here. So bacteriophage or bacterial virus. Initially, their fitness would be here at the zero line, but when you first start off this experiment, you crank the temperature up to 43 degrees Celsius, the phage aren't happy. They don't reproduce as well, and they're less fit. That is to say, they produce fewer offspring. 
fewer viral particles come out of a bacterium at 43 degrees than it does at 37 degrees. But if you continually passage the, the viruses at 43 degrees Celsius, they get better and better. So what do I mean by passage? It means you have a flask of E. coli, you put in a virus, the virus explodes, and be before you know it, you have started off with one viral particle, one phi X174, and before you know it, you have trillions and trillions of them, okay, like over the course of a couple hours. Then you take a small number of the guys from this flask, and you put them into a new flask of freshly growing naive E. coli, that is to say E. coli with no, bac with, with no bacteriophage. And you put a few of these guys in here, and what happens? They grow up and, and they lyse this one. And then you take a couple of these guys from this flask, and you put them into another flask of E. coli. You, this is what's called passaging. You're just taking a few of the viruses from this flask and putting them into a new flask of fresh E. coli that are growing at 43 degrees. So what you're doing is you're favoring mutations that allow the virus to grow well at high temperature. And what you're seeing, this is just a measure of how well the viruses grow. You can see that both in the Texas, they did the experiment twice, once in Texas, once in Idaho. The Texas strain, uh, over a few, day, few, few days, uh, very, very rapidly did much better at 43 degrees, and so did the Idaho strain. The Idaho strain, for some reasons, didn't do quite as well as the Texas strain, but they both increased dramatically in how well they could grow at 43 degrees. So their fitness increased in both cases. Now, the neat thing about viruses is, and especially a virus like e Phi X174 that has a small genome, is that you can actually sequence the genome and find out what mutations were responsible for the adapt adaptive response. So which mutations allowed the, the virus to do well at, at high temperature? And these are all the changes they saw in um, the Texas, uh, uh, Texas experiment and also in the Idaho experiment. And so what you see here is each, so all of those 5,383 nucleotides in the genome are numbered from 1 to 5,383. And so what you're seeing here is the position of the change and what type of change it was from, okay? So this would mean um, it was from an amino acid T to I. T, tyrosine maybe? I, uh, I forget, isoleucine or something like that. I don't, don't have all the 20 amino acid codes remembered, okay? Memorized. But this is probably, probably from alanine to valine, for instance. But these are the positions at which you had uh, had the mutations. Here was a case where you had a deletion in the Texas uh, analysis, and here you had a deletion in the Idaho um, experiment as well. Note that in many of these cases, you see the same exact mutation occurring independently in the Texas experiment and also in the Idaho experiment. So, for instance, here's an experiment where, here's a site where we have a change from H to Y, amino acid H to Y, at position 4110, and that occurred in both of them. This deletion looks as if it also occurred in the same way in both of these, in both of these experiments. Now, there's two ways you'd explain this, the fact that, they, that you get the same results. One is that there's some sort of wild contamination problem. But that doesn't seem likely because the experiments were performed in quite different sites, right? Contamination meaning maybe some of the Texas viruses that somehow got into the flasks in Idaho when they were doing this experiment. That's, that we can dismiss because they're very careful to do the experiments in widely separated areas. So what that means is these mutations were selected independently in the two different experiments, right? Natural selection or selection in these, in these experiments acted in the same way and favored the same mutations when they occurred. And so here's just a final thing they could do is they could look at the frequencies of these mutations and how they changed over the course of the experiment. So for instance, here's one of the mutations, and you can see that um, kind of like those, the little computer simulations I showed you where when you had these favored mutations, they would sort of go up in frequency and then they'd, they'd plateau. We can see the same sort of behavior here, but what you're seeing is that these mutations spread through the population and fix in, in, incredibly rapidly. So there's very large population sizes, and these mutations are very favored. That is to say, the individuals that bear these mutations have a huge fitness advantage over the in individuals that don't. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say about experimental evolution. I gave you an example with the, um, of course, the corn, which isn't so surprising, the, the senescence experiment that Michael Rose did, and then an example with viruses. And people are doing these types of experiments all the time in the lab. Often, they're not evolutionary biologists interested in, in testing questions in population genetics, say, but they're working in companies and they're trying to evolve proteins that, say, bind something more tightly. And so these are, you know, for whatever reasons, maybe a customer wants something that will find a particular protein for whatever reason, and they can actually evolve these things in the lab. And so they use evolution or selection in molecular biology labs all over the world. Um, but let's give, the, give you some examples from the wild. 
And I'll tell you one of my favorite examples, one I'm not going to show you, show you or describe, but one involves a, a couple, the, the Rosemary and Peter Grant, who are at Princeton University, and they've gone back to a particular island in the Galapagos and studied a population of uh, finch for, well, since the 1970s. They go every year, it's a small island, and basically what they can do is they can document every single bird on the island, there's not that many of them, and how uh, natural selection has favored uh, different beak shapes depending on the seed availability in that year. And there's a really good book that I would recommend, I actually even recommended it to my mom, I thought it was such a good book. It's called The Beak of the Finch, it's by a fellow named Jonathan Weiner. Um, it's a good readable uh, explanation of these experiments. So if you're interested, you can check it out of the library and uh, read it. It's not obviously something I would require that you know, but it's just if you're interested. I wanted to give an example, not from Princeton, but from Cal. And so I decided to give you uh, an example uh, of an experiment that was done recently by uh, this woman right here, Hopi Hoekstra. So she was a Bio 1B student. She was an integrative biology major here at University of Texas, or at University of California. I'm thinking I'm <laughs> Texas. But University of California. She was on the volleyball team in 1991. There she is. Um, she was in a sorority here. There's a picture of the sorority I took on a game day coming down from steps uh, from the stadium. Um, here she is at a party. There she is right there. <laughs> and you know, she knows they're very discreetly hiding something in their hands. I have no idea what it is, but um, I'm sure she's going to love it that I'm showing those photos of, you, of her, rather. Uh, and there, here she is in the field. So she studies, uh, she's a mammologist, and she studies um, mice, basically, in the field. And the, the work she's doing now is actually out in the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico, and she's studying mice that occur in these sand dunes. What I'm going to describe is the work she did as a, what's called a postdoc. It's, it's what you do after you um, got your PhD. You, often people have a couple of years where they get to do nothing but research before they get to the job like me where the, they have all sorts of other responsibilities. And she um, studies uh, cryptic coloration in mice. So the cryptic coloration example you've probably gotten in, in high school is the example with the, with the uh, moths on trees in, in England. This is an experiment that, um, or an observation that people made that with industrialization you had trees that became much more sooty in experience from the, the from coal, from the, you know, they're burning a lot of coal at the time. And the, the wild, these moths, uh, their, their ancient phenotype, their primitive phenotype is to be white, so they actually match these trees. But what they're finding is that these melanic uh, forms were actually spreading and increasing in, in frequency. The story isn't quite as, is a little bit more complicated than what I'm saying, but not much more complicated. And I think there's actually another, I think there's actually a white moth here and a black moth here, but I can never, I think that's a black moth, maybe. I can never actually find them. They're very cryptic. But what she's studying is, is um, cryptic coloration in mice. And so there's, there's a lot, so if you think about the must must, the must domesticus, the, the mouse they use in labs all over the world, the, a lot is known about their coat colors and the genes responsible for different coat color polymorphisms. So for instance, here's a little mouse that has a little, it's a piebald mouse, and you can actually see the piebald mutation in humans. There's a basketball player with the piebald mutation. There's the mouse with the piebald mutation. This is, this is, people, people know the mutation that's responsible for this, right? So it's, it's a mutation in the endothelin receptor B. It's a piebald mutation, okay? But that's the house mouse. She was actually studying uh, oh, here's some more other mutations that you're probably aware of uh, in, in lots of animals are albinos. Um, they have a, a mutation, a tyro, uh, tyrosinase uh, mutation. This is typically a deleterious mutation because they, they don't have any melanin, okay? So here's an example of, of albinism in, in humans, and here's some examples. This is a, a gorilla that has this mutation, a koala, a zebra, and so forth. There's an albino squirrel, that's pretty cool. And then, of course, there's the albino mouse, a very cute little mouse. So she was, color, she was studying adaptive or cryptic coloration in these uh, rock pocket mice um, that occur in the southwest, the American southwest. And I know, is anybody here from Arizona? No? Must be a few people. I'm not from Arizona, so I'll keep my hand down. So I guess it's a California <laughs> university. But if you go, if you, if you drive along the southern part of Arizona along, say, Highway 8, what you'll see is typically what you see is lots and lots of this, all right? You know, hours and hours of this. But occasionally, when things get very exciting, you'll go across these lo fairly recent lava flows where the rock is more basaltic, darker in color. So occasionally, you come across these basalt flows. Uh, so this is an example of, of from the Pinacate lava flow uh, where you see this much darker substrate. And what you see in these darker 
in the darker rocks is same species of rock pocket mice, but you see this melanic form, okay, a darker form. And then the typical form you see all over the rest of Arizona has this more light pelage, okay, lighter coat. And she was interested in the genes that underlie this and whether or not this coat coloration was, was of adaptive significance. So this is just giving you an example of the different places where she studied her different study sites. This is the Pinacates I just showed you, um, and it's located here in Arizona. And what she's showing you here is that on the lava flow, that means this is lava flow, that's not lava flow. Here's the Kensin lava flow, lava flow, not lava flow. That is to say the grounds just surrounding the lava flows. On the lava flows, you find lots of these dark mice, and right next to the lava flows, you find lots of the light mice. That's what it means. Okay, that's what this, this figure means. And that's true for these other lava flows as well. Here's the Kenzin. All the mice she found on the lava flows were, were dark, and all the mice she found on, not, you know, just adjacent to the lava flow were white. And, and that's the true for these others as well. Oh, and then down here is an estimate of the age of these lava flows. And, and for reasons I'll describe later, you can actually very precisely date lava flows, okay, using what's called radiometric age dating. So the age of these lava flows is, is well established. And here's some of the, the mice in the lab. So you can actually see the differences from each of these different lava flows. This is the type of mouse you find on the lava flow. This is the, the mouse coloration you'll find just adjacent to the lava flow in the pinacates and so forth. This is what, you know, if you go upstairs and we're go to go through the drawers of the museum here, you find lots of examples of mice that look like this, kind of flattened out with tags on them. Not very happy. So what she did is she took what's called an association study. So she looked at these mice. And she noticed, and I should say, too, that this, this work was done not only with Hopi Hoekstra, but with this fellow Michael Nachman, who's at the University of Arizona, so the Nachman Hoekstra. Um, what she did is she looked at the, the, the hairs on these Pinacati mice, the, the lava flow mice, and noticed that, th that the, the hairs look reminiscent of a mutation that you find in the mice, that the, the house mouse, the mouse that everybody studies in labs all over the world. And she thought, well, maybe the same mutations, in the, or mutations in the same genes are responsible for the dark coloration in these rock pocket mice as the ones that cause dark coloration in laboratory mice. That was the, the thought. So, sh so you, know, you have 30,000 genes that you can think of out there in the genome. She tried to limit which ones to really study a lot by using this what call, what's called a candidate gene approach, to say, concentrate your attention based on what you know in a, in a related species. And the basic idea is this. In these association studies, you have some mutation that's responsible for the phenotype. And so in this case, the, the mutation in the gene that, that's responsible for the phenotype is indicated by a star. Each one of these lines represents a chromosome. So these chromosomes might come from, would come from different individuals, uh, that you, different mice, say, okay? Now, you may not actually have sequenced or actually know what the mutation is. You may never actually see the star, but what you can get is places nearby that are polymorphic, that is to say, nucleotide sites, the SNP sites I told you about earlier, where you know that there's variation. And the idea is that when this mutation appears, it's going to occur on some chromosome, and that it's going to at least initially be associated with specific sets of, of nucleotide polymorphisms nearby. So you can actually assay uh, the sites, you actually assay the, the vertical lines here, you can measure the phenotype, and the idea is if you see a phenotype that's associated with certain uh, SNPs, that it must also be associated with uh, some gene that's nearby, some mutation that's nearby. So this is what she did. Uh, and so she actually looked at a mutation in what's called the MC1R gene. It's one of these genes that she knew from the house, the, the laboratory mouse might be responsible for this. This is a, this, this MC1R uh, protein sits on the membrane of the cell, it's called a transmembrane uh, G-coupled receptor. And what happens is uh, things like MSH will bind to the outside, and when it binds to the outside of this, it causes C-AMP expression to be expressed or increased inside the cell, and you get what's called a U-melanin U-melanin uh, being produced. You get dark hair. So if you look out, I see lots of people have lots of U-melanin in this class, okay? Now, if Agouti is another protein that can bind to this um, protein, this MC1R, and when it binds, it shuts it down. So when, M when Agouti is present, it represses the, um, the activity of this MC1R gene. You don't get a lot of CAMP, and you get Fe melanin being produced. So I'd look out there, and I see a few people with, with very light hair that have lots of Fe melanin, okay? And you get light hair. So this is a mouse that has lots of Fe melanin being produced. This 
uh, eumelanin rather, or phthalate fe melanin. This is an individual that has lots of eumelanin being produced, dark hair. So this is the actual data from our paper. And what we're seeing here is um, the, this is the two different copies of the gene from each mouse. So this is one particular mouse. You can see, remember, it gets two, it has two copies of the gene, one from mom, one from dad. So what you're seeing is copy one, copy two for, for this dark mouse. And then you have this other dark mouse where you're seeing copy one, copy two, and so forth. These are all the dark mice, and then here's all the light mice. Here's, for instance, well, let's go to the very bottom. It's easy to see. This line here represents the DNA sequence from uh, mom or dad from one chromosome, and here's the sequence from the other chromosome for this particular mouse. And wherever you see a dot, um, this is a shorthand notation that people use in these, in these types of figures to mean that it's whatever is here is the same as at the top. So it's going to be a C. Wherever you see a dot, this is the reference sequence at the top. So wherever you see a dot, it means you put in the reference sequence nucleotide at that position. Is that clear? Is it clear how to read this? Now, do you see anything uh, remarkable about this graph or about this figure? I mean, she sort of draws your attention to it with, by boxing it in, but note this. All these dark individuals have a T at this position, a T at this position, a T at this position, and a C at that position in the gene, right? And they have at least one copy of that, right? So up here, all these individuals, let's see, all these individuals at the top, from here on up, they're all homozygous for having all four of those mutations. That is to say, both chromosomes have those four mutations. These individuals from here down to here, they're heterozygous, right? And all the individuals down here are homozygous for not having those four mutations. And so she used a subscript little d uh, for having not having those four mutations, big D for having those mutations. So these are all the big D, big D individuals. These are the big D, little d, and these are the little d, little d. What she's pointing out here is that there's a perfect association between the color of the, of the coat of the mouse and these four mutations. Now, the, so, so the inference is that these four mutations are responsible uh, in the MC1R gene are responsible for the dark coloration you see in the mice. Now, the best experiment she could do, which she, she hasn't been able to manage to do for technical reasons, is you take a white mouse and you basically, um, uh, through transgenic methods that you can learn about in, in advanced molecular biology courses, you actually stick that gene into a mouse and see if it becomes a dark colored mouse. So that's, that's the experiment that most molecular biologists would consider as definitive. For this case, the evidence is so overwhelming that those four mutations are responsible for the coat coloration that it's probably not necessary to, to even do the experiment. So this is just to summarize what we have. We have those four mutations. If, you're, if, you're, if, you, got it, if you have at least one copy of, the, of those four mutations on at least one of the chromosomes, you have dark coloration. And this is just showing you where those mutations occurred in the MC1R gene. Two of them occurred on the part of the transmembrane protein that faces outside of the cell. That's these up here, and two of them occur on the part that faces inside the cell. These are the, each one of these circles represents an amino acid that's coded for by the, um, by the MC1R DNA sequence. So this is, this is the situation you have. We're just showing you uh, pictures of, here I'm showing you a picture of the mice on their, on their natural habit back background. Here's a, a mouse that's mismatched. It's actually a dark mouse on a white background. Here's a white mouse on a dark background, and here's a dark mouse on a dark background on the lava flow. So the, the, the thought, of course, is that you know, if you're a predator, you can actually see the mismatched individuals much more easily than you can uh, see these individuals. But of course, when you make a statement like that, it seems obvious, but you have to remember that's, well, we're speaking, right? I, I look at that and I say, it looks very obvious to me that, you know, that these guys would be the ones that would be easy to find and pick off. But you know, I don't actually, I'm not a predator on mice, okay? And so it turns out that maybe our in intuition is wrong about this. So you need to do experiments to actually determine whether the mismatched mice um, have an advantage. So as you might imagine, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a Trek fan. So this is one of the episodes where uh, uh, Kirk has to battle Spock, and it's called a Amok Time is the episode if you're interested in. Um, so what you need to do is some sort of tournament type of study, right? And so what this, this is a very difficult experiment to do now, but it has been in, uh, performed about 60 years ago by this fellow uh, Dice, and he basically studied alpredation in deer mice. They're, they're, they're mice that are uh, similar or closer related to the, to the pocket mice that uh, Dr. Hoekstra and, and uh, Nachman studied. And what he did was this. just took a barn, and he, on the floor he made two different arenas. He put some dark colored uh, rock on one, and he put some light colored sand and rock on the other. 
and he put dark and white mice out onto the deer mice out on uh, out into these two different arenas and let them sort of scurry around. That's what mice do. And then he put some barn owls in the barn, right? And just let the barn owls do what they do, which is they eat mice. And so the barn owls would sort of swoop down, meet the mice, and they just counted which mice were eaten and which survived. And what they found in this experiment is that the uh, is that the deer mice that were mismatched to the substrate were much more frequently picked off by the by the owls. You know, owls have notoriously good eyesight, but even they find it easier to find a mismatched mouse than a uh, mouse that matches the substrate. And then Dr. Hoekstra has done similar studies more recently where she, um, you can't, it's very difficult to get the permission to do experiments like that nowadays. I guess you, you know, people don't like to see little mice being eaten by barn owls. But you can take, you know, this is what she did, she took, made little clay models of mice. So she has an entire lab, graduate students and postdocs, they have these fun little parties where they make little clay mice. And, um, and they don't fire the mice, okay, so it's not like you make the clay mice and fire them. You, you keep them so they're still soft clay and you paint them. So you get the paint too, it's like a craft thing. So they paint the mice, they paint, paint them to look as much like they can, like the dark colored or the white light colored mice. And then they go out in the field and, and in the evening they'll sort of stick these little mice all over the place and the next day they come in or a couple days later they look around, they pick up their little clay mice and they look for evidence of predation. So if you see like a, a bite mark on them you know, that's going to be preserved in the clay or scratch marks like some owl came by and then realized it's just clay, ah, you know. But they, they look for evidence of predation and they find in these experiments just like you'd expect that the mice that mismatched their background in which they sort of placed the, the clay mice or have show evidence of predation at a much higher rate than the mice that match the background, okay? Oops. Just a little bit more on this. Just to so she's also studied the distribution of these MC1R uh, alleles, the, the case where we call the big D and little d alleles in what are called transects. What you do is you, you make a line and you just walk a lot along that line and you collect mice whenever you see them, okay? You trap them actually, so you put traps along the transects. And so this is the transect, there's the lava flow. So you basically in this transect you have some parts where, um, where you have the regular light colored sand of the desert and then this is the dark colored part. And so this is the substrate color along the transect and as you'd expect, the frequency of the MC1R gene allele, those big D alleles skyrockets, goes almost to one over the lava flows and then decreases on either side of it. So this is, you can actually if you want, and it's, it's, it's useful to think about there being two populations. You have the population of mice living on the lava flows and the population of, of mice not living on the lava flows. And here's another example where you have migration of individuals from the lava flows out into the desert and from the desert into the lava flows. As far as they can tell, the mice don't know any better. They don't know if they're mismatched or not. Okay, they're mice. They don't have, they're not super smart. And so, um, so you have natural migration of the mice that go out here, but of course when they, the dark mice come out in the light sands, they probably get eaten up pretty quickly. And the same for the light mice that find themselves in the rocks. And this is just to show that it's not, um, what she did is this is the frequency of the MC1R uh, big D allele over the, that transect. Once again, noting that on the dark, uh, on the dark rocks, the frequency of that big D allele is very high, but it's very low in the white sands. But here's another gene. So you can say, well, what, is that true for every single gene in the genome? Do they all show this pattern? Because if they all show this pattern, then clearly natural selection isn't acting on the MC1R gene, right? And so this is some other gene that has nothing to do with coat coloration. And you can see that it doesn't show any pattern going across the, um, across that transect, that it's, uh, its frequency is about the same on the, on the light substrate as it is on the dark substrate. So natural selection is clearly targeting just the MC1R gene. Okay, and this is the last slide. This is just to um, you know, point out there's all sorts of interesting things you can do with coat coloration in mice, and this is the type of work that Dr. Hoekstra has been doing more recently. I should mention that she's now at Harvard, so she's got faculty um, at Harvard. And uh, she's been turning her attention to mice that live in Nebraska on sand dunes and uh, mice that live um, on the uh, beaches in the, along the Gulf of Mexic Mexico. So I don't know if you know about the Gulf of Mexico, but you go along these beaches and they have like pristine, almost sugary in color white sands along these strand beaches. And then if you go inland, if you go into like Florida, just the mainland, you see the, the normal dark, you know, dirt like you have everywhere. The mice that live on these on these beaches on the white sand have very light colors, coat colors, like this guy right here, this cute little guy here and here. Whereas the mice that live inland have more dark, normal, mousy type uh, coat colors. And she's been studying the mutations that are responsible for these light colored uh, mice in the, in the sands. So that's it.